Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Hello, and on today's episode of Afternoon Light, I'm joined by the second longest serving Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, who will be familiar to all of you, I am very, very sure. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you on Afternoon Light, Mr Howard. Thank you so much. Well, it's a great privilege, Georgina, particularly on a segment that's devoted to the founder of our party. Yes. Well, look, Afternoon Light's been a great joy for me to record because we are talking about so many important aspects of our history, that era. And you wrote, of course, this magisterial book, The Menzies Years, about the Menzies era. And it really is something that, as you say, it shaped modern Australia. Well, it did. What inspired me to make it, I was encouraged to write the book by Geoffrey Blaney, somebody who I have endless admiration for. He said to me, you ought to write a biography of Menzies. And I decided to take it up and to do it in a more political way than perhaps the pure historical scholarship of Alan Martin's biography, which I thought was very good. I felt that Menzies had had an inadequate rap Mm. as the greatest political contributor to the modern Australia. When we think of the modern Australia, we think of its enormous success. We think of the post-World War II migration program, which admittedly was started by Arthur Colwell, but consolidated and expanded by Menzies. We think of our engagement with Asia. Now, the seminal moment in that occurred during the Menzies period, Mm. and that was the commerce agreement between Australia and Japan. And when you think that only 12 years before that agreement was signed, 1957, people, including your late grandfather, had been prisoners of war of the Japanese and resentment, bitterness, hatred in the Australian community. Japan was still strong, but Menzies and, to his great credit, John McEwen, who was the driving ministerial force, rose above that. And how prescient they were was demonstrated what, Fifteen years later, when Britain joined the common market, it seems yeah. a long time ago now, they've left the common market, sensibly in my view, yeah. joined the common market and turned their back on imperial preference. We had, in a sense, a ready-made entree with our mineral discoveries into Asia, into Japan, and later on, of course, China. Now, that was made possible by the breakthrough of the Commerce Agreement. Now, that, to me, contributed more to our relations with Asia, not that I denigrate the contribution that Gough Whitlam made and he understood the changing times in relation to China in a way that his liberal opponents at the time didn't. But now there's some of the things that make me think. And I, the other thing that I really give means he's incredible praise for is his breakthrough on state aid to independent, mainly, but not only Catholic schools, because Not only did it produce this remarkable mix of public and private that we have in Australia, where 34% of school-aged children are educated in government schools, but it also achieved an enormous breakthrough in ending sectarianism. I can remember sectarianism was still quite strong in Australia in the 50s and into the 60s, but it really came crashing down in the 60s partly because of the great breakthrough, because it ended a 100 years of real discrimination against Australia's Catholic community. And that simple Presbyterian, as Menzies described himself, (laughs) was at the helm of all of that. So they are some of the things that I... And I think of his championing of the mining industry, his partnership with the country party, then National Party, meant that the interests of farmers were always prominent now. Mining and farming has always been important to Australia, and in my view, it always will be. On the commerce agreement with Japan and state aid, the two major policy decisions that Menzies made during that era that you say really were instrumental in shaping modern Australia, both of them required incredible bravery against Well, both of them ran against ingrained 
intolerance of different kind. And the ingrained hostility to the Japanese was understandable after the appalling treatment, but the national interest required that that be put aside. And in my own experience, my dealings with Japan, with Japanese prime ministers such as Shinjo Abe, I realised just how important that was and how the attitude of Australians had changed. Australians value our relationship with Japan and that wouldn't have come about if it hadn't been for the leadership that Menzies gave. Now on state aid, well, there was a lot of old-fashioned bigotry. Through the 1950s, the Liberal Party was overwhelmingly, in terms of the divide in the Christian church, was overwhelmingly Protestant. Most Australian Catholics had voted Labor. Not for reasons of theology, it had nothing to do with that, it had to do with socio-economic status. How difficult is it when you are pushing for a policy that goes against the ingrained attitudes of your country? I mean, how difficult well, is well, that? Well, it's, 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 it's always difficult. difficult, but it's less difficult if you appeal both to people's better instincts and you also appeal to the national interest. And the national interest in having good relations with Japan when it came to trade were fairly easy to present. The great advantage of the breakthrough in State A was that it was becoming increasingly obvious, except to the very narrow-minded, that 20% of Australian schoolchildren were being educated by a section of the population that was paying the same taxes as everybody else. But because of the sharp decline in the number of men and women going to religious orders in Catholic education institutions, it was becoming a crushing financial burden. And I think in the end, people thought, well, that's not fair. Mm. But it needed somebody to legitimise that feeling that it wasn't fair. And that's where Menzies came into it. And something that Labor grappled with Oh, the extraordinary thing was that the Labor Party still then, (laughs) its members of parliament and its leadership, not so much its leadership at the top, Arthur Call was a very devout Catholic, it was still an overwhelmingly, in its origins, a Catholic party, particularly since the great split during World War I over conscription, which really saw a lot of non-Catholics leave the Labor Party. It's a hypothetical, of course, but if Ben Chifley had won the 49 election, what sort of Australia would we have ended up with? Can you speculate? Because his agenda was Well, we certainly would have ended up with an Australia where he would have renewed his attack on the private trading banks. He was philosophically opposed to private ownership of banks came out of his experience during the Depression, but leaving aside what the origin of it was, the motivation was completely wrong. And one of the things that really consolidated Menzies' leadership of the new Liberal Party in the late 1940s was his successful campaign against back nationalisation. It brought forth all of his great rhetorical skills based on a simple message private ownership of your own resources, which is pretty relevant at the moment given the clear intention of the Albanese government to interfere with people's money invested in their superannuation. (laughs) Indeed. We can only speculate what Robert Menzies would think of all this and current debates. Mr Howard, in your book you write about your parents. Your sort of first chapter is about your parents and the first Menzies election when he's running as the leader of the Liberal Party in 49. You're age 10 and you go to the movies and then you come out of the movies and you hear that the Liberals have won the election. Your parents, you write, voted Liberal. They They were devout, very strong Liberals. Yeah, particularly your father. Your mother was less less devout. My my (laughs) mother was a very liberally inclined, very conservative person, but Dad was a small businessman. And he was slightly more of a Menzies man than mum. They did disagree, interestingly enough, on one issue. And to my certain recollection, it was the only time they voted differently. It was on the referendum to ban the Communist Party. Yes. My mother voted no. My father voted yes. 
Mum didn't believe that you should drive movements underground. And she also thought Menzies was a little bit high-handed in the way he handled the referendum. And some people agreed with her and some didn't. But the reason the referendum was defeated was that people like my mother had reservations and voted no. And interestingly enough, a few months out from the referendum, opinion polls were showing 70 to 80 (laughs) percent of people intending to vote yes. But gradually... As it got closer and closer, doubts arose and the innate conservatism. And I think that Celtic scepticism, which is a feature of Australian's personality, came to the fore. Yes, it's a very important lesson to consider. Uh, well, it's very a... important. If you want to get a referendum carried in this country, you've got to be absolutely certain of your ground. You've got to have a simple proposition. You've got to explain what it means and not assume that fuzzy words are going to get you through. They don't. Indeed. Menzies came to the Prime Ministership once again in '49 after having spent some time in the wilderness and obviously then uh, founding among, with others, the Liberal Party. That period, though, in the wilderness, on the back bench, where he really was considering his future, I mean, there were moments apparently when he considered leaving Parliament... And you obviously have had your rise and fall in your political career coming to the Prime Ministership in 96. How important is it to have that type of moment in your career where you have those major setbacks? In order well, to- it varies. Some people don't, but most do who get anywhere. I don't think Bob Menzies ever really thought of leaving. Now, I can't base that on anything other than an instinct He certainly must have felt very down when, to paraphrase the words of the Scottish poet, he said he would go away and bleed a while and he was feeling depressed. But he used his time well. He delivered the famous Forgotten People broadcasts. He set about forming the Liberal Party. He learnt, I think, to stoop to conquer. It was said of him that he didn't tolerate people who he felt were a little inferior. I wasn't around, I don't know. But you do learn when you've had a leadership position that's taken from you. I know from my own experience, I learned the next time around to handle things a little differently. And I'm sure that applied to Menzies, not that I seek to compare as personalities were of different backgrounds. There are a lot of things in common. Both our parents owned small businesses <laughs> and... Uh, He, although being a Presbyterian, attended a Methodist church, as I did, and it was influenced by the values of that denomination, which, of course, in Britain has had a very close association with the Labor side of politics (laughs) rather than the Conservative. Well, of course, he did have relatives. In fact, I think it was his grandfather was quite a strong Labor man. Uh, uh, Oh, yeah, and he had quite a political background. Yes. Yes, it was Sidney Sampson. Mm. Yes, was quite a substantial yeah. figure, member for Lowen. And yeah, yeah, no, he was quite a substantial figure. And, and actually, a lot of the ideas of Sidney Sampson you can see in Robert Menzies, particularly those early years of his time in politics. Menzies obviously had some pretty effective, impressive ministers. How did he run his cabinet? Did you think that was a model to emulate his form of cabinet government? When I came to the position in 1996, which was, what, 30 years after he had retired, it was all a bit too distant, but the principles are the same. You want to treat the Cabinet seriously. People get into enormous trouble when they try and short-circuit the process. The protocols of government are there to assist and protect, not to obstruct and frustrate. They may appear obstructionist and frustrating on occasions, but they're not designed to do that. They're designed to make sure that every combination and possible outcome is considered. And if you stick by the protocols, you consult the Cabinet, you don't preempt it. You normally have a Cabinet that works effectively and a Cabinet that doesn't leak. And there's nothing more destabilising than the cabinet leaking and it just is destructive now. By and large, my cabinet didn't leak and from my recollection, the Menzies cabinet didn't either. And the other thing, of course, that was very important 
was the relationship he had with the country party. Yes. And it's something that I followed very closely. I should also say that Malcolm Fraser, when he was Prime Minister, he and Doug Anthony had a very close working relationship and the bond between the two parties was very strong, as it was in my time, had been in Menzies' time. But Menzies took the institutions very seriously. He respected Parliament, he respected the courts, and he respected Cabinet. Now, of course, we believe in the rule of law, even when we sort of don't like the outcome. <laughs> you raised earlier in relation to the commerce agreement with Japan, of course, John McEwen, who was his trade minister as well as leader of the country party. I mean, that relationship where Menzies is allowing... Well, McEwen, McEwen where to... actually, when McEwen, he was just about to become leader of the country party when he negotiated that trade agreement. I think Fadden was still the leader of the country party and deputy prime minister, but McEwen was a very senior figure then and Black Jack, as he was known as, was very close to men. He was a very dogged advocate for country interests and he saw that as his responsibility. He'd been a soldier settler. He was given an allocation of land as a soldier settler after World War I. And he was a very successful political figure, very strong, a very powerful supporter of Menzies on national security, always argued very vigorously for our involvement in what was a very unpopular military operation in Vietnam, Mm. which Menzies, of course, was the one who initially committed Australia to that participation. He was without doubt the most powerful, influential figure apart from Menzies during that whole period. He was more than just a deputy prime minister. He was a force of political nature. Another really important figure in the Menzies cabinet was, of course, Percy Spender, and one of his Mm. greatest achievements was the ANZUS Agreement, which was signed in 1951 Mm. and was something that Menzies was not entirely as enthusiastic as sort of more contemporary Prime Ministers of Australia are? I think Menzies probably found the idea of having such a small, intense military pact with two other countries, one of which wasn't Britain, strange. Yeah. I don't think he was against the American alliance. No. I think in that sense, Percy Spender was more of a sort of an America file, if Mm. I can put it that way. He did a great job as external affairs minister or foreign minister, as they were later called, but others have done the job foreign (laughs) minister with equal distinction, (laughs) if not greater distinction. It's interesting, Menzies is said to a remark that ANZUS was built on a foundation of jelly. Well, he probably did say things like that, but it was a very, very important pact and to the extent that driving force behind it was Percy Spender. He deserves a lot of credit. I think proper reading of the history suggests that at a critical time, Arthur Fadden, who was the acting Prime Minister, played quite a role in it as well. But the truth is that it was the right pact. And I think it's fair to say that if there were any reluctance about a very deep national security involvement with the Americans on the part of Menzies, he completely disabused people of that later on because nobody could have been a stauncher supporter of America's role in our part of the world than Menzies. Well, absolutely, and the Vietnam... Well, Vietnam was the 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 most difficult foreign policy involvement that we've had. It was... I mean, others have been unpopular, but because it involved the commitment of combat battalion and over a period of time something in the order of 50 or 60,000 Australian troops and the loss sadly of five to 600 Australian lives. It was a very controversial involvement and it did involve of course the introduction of conscription. Mr Howard you were the Prime Minister when ANZUS was first invoked and obviously Australia came to the assistance of the United States in Afghanistan through that. How, on your observation, has ANZUS evolved from that 1951 signing through to Vietnam commitment, then obviously up to... Well, I think the interesting thing is that it was always the view that ANZUS was about Australia 
being aided in our hour of need by America. Mm. As it turned out, the first time it was invoked, incidentally, on the advice of your father. He was the foreign minister in my government and in a telephone conversation as I was flying back to Australia two days after 9-11, we had a conversation and he said we should invoke answers. And of course, it made sense to do so because it had been an attack on the metropolitan territory of one of the three signatory countries. And although the military disproportions were obvious, it was entirely the right thing for us to come to America's assistance. And it made a deep impression on the United States because people forget at that time, the Americans were preoccupied about when and where the next attack on the American mainland would take place. Of course, yeah. Thought we'd change conversation now to things domestic and education. You've touched on Menzies and state aid, but tertiary education. Well, of course, he said when he retired that two of the things of which he was most proud was the relationship with the country party and what he'd done for university education. And there's no doubt that the Murray reforms, tertiary education, the expansion of it, and, and there's a lot of talk that free education, university education, brought in by Gough Whitlam, uh, revolutionised things. Well, I happen to be the beneficiary of the period before then. I went to university between 1957 and 1961, and I did so for most of the time on a Commonwealth scholarship, yeah. which was awarded on the basis of... I didn't get one when I did my leaving certificate, which was the then finalising exam in the New South Wales system, it's now called what uh, in higher ed- HSC or something rather. Yeah, I'm a Victorian these days, so yeah, it's VCE yeah, in BCE Victoria. <laughs> we know what we're yeah. talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got, I picked it up on the strength of my university results. Now that paid fees, and which was great. So I think the impact of free universities, so to speak, can be over. Emphasise, but of course we no longer have that. We have the HEC system, which I think is a good system. It was introduced by the Labor government with our support from opposition and and made possible by the fact that we had for some time in opposition been saying that the country could no longer afford free university education. I think there are other deficiencies in the education system, but the great thing about Menzies was that he made possible the expansion of the university system in Australia. And those expansions were terrific. And he was a great believer in higher education and it became available to so many more people. It's interesting when you read Menzies on education, how he sees it as a quite important, as a civilising force, creating people who are critical thinkers, who are independent of spirit. Oh, he is. Not a a vocational undertaking. He saw the vocational advantage of education, but he saw uh, the advantage of a high-quality education in its own right as something that encouraged people to think, to philosophise, to come to conclusions about the direction and meaning of society and nations. And it was a high-minded commitment to education that was a hallmark of his contribution. These days... The Liberal governments, as they have come and gone, have been a little bit vexed when it comes to dealing with higher education policy and there's been a reticence to either get involved or maybe to reduce funding for certain degrees because there's not necessarily a decent job outcome at the end. Do you think that is something that Liberals need to reflect on, the ideas that Menzies brought to education, that this is about creating independent thinkers, critical thinkers, rather than just think about job readiness? Well, I, without trying to force a comparison with the Menzies period, which is a number of decades in the past, I have been a little disappointed in the approach of some Liberal administrations at both the state and federal level about education. I would have liked to have seen a more rigorous defence of a strong, for want of a better description, orthodox curriculum. Mm. I can't allow Alan Tudge's retirement from Parliament to go in this context without paying tribute to him. He seemed to me, at a national level, to do more than any other education spokesman 
on our side of politics for some years to call out postmodernism and the way in which attempts have been made to mangle the curriculum. And I think he tried very hard at a federal level to do that. And I would like to see more of that approach adopted. Well, we're in opposition at a federal level at the present time, but you can do things from opposition. And I hope we retain the government we now have in New South Wales, which is a very good government. Do you think that council culture and those deplatforming this these well, I think all of that postmodernist is, ideas yeah. have reached their apogee. Do you think they're tapering? <clears> off? Well, or? I was saying to a friend of mine today that in the last couple of weeks, two of the icons of that movement worldwide have fallen: Jacinda Ardern and Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Is that a sign? Not wishing them any personal it, ill no. will, but I drink to their respective departures. <laughs> Maybe it's a sign. I hope so. Yeah. But it is fraught, isn't it? Because Look, you, you have to engage this, you, do. you have to engage the substance of the argument. Yeah. And it's no good on thinking, oh it's a fat will go, it won't go and the absurdity of the, the way in which people play around with language. You know. Roald Dahl's been rewritten. The hmm? books of Roald Dahl yeah, have well, been it's, rewritten because you can't call nonsense. someone fat anymore or yeah. ugly or... <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy stuff. Yeah. But it has to be called out, and it's got to be called out by more than journalists and commentators because there's always more on the other side. It's got to be called out by political leaders and you'll never get it called out by the left. They'll encourage it. Yeah. And it needed to be called out. And I would love to hear a Liberal Premier, a Liberal Prime Minister, we don't have a Liberal Prime Minister, and I'm denouncing this sort of stuff in the strongest possible terms. Because it seems to me that there's a latent rejection of it in the community, but many people are, for what of a better expression, too frightened to say anything about it. Yeah. Because they'll be regarded as... A, old-fashioned, intolerant, bigoted. They're nothing of the kind. They just want proper standards and standards of historical truth and accuracy and tradition and custom are worth defending. But a lot of people prefer to stay below the parapet and well, just they avoid do that, the confrontation. Well, they do that, find the parapet's no longer there. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Winston Churchill is famous for saying that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Menzies leaves an incredible legacy and obviously at the Robert Menzies Institute we are really on a mission to celebrate and commemorate it. But he didn't always get things right. I mean, your mother obviously took a view on the attempt to ban the Communist Party and I think history has shown that her judgment was right and his was wrong. You may have a different view. What do you think, in your view, was Menzies' greatest error well, incidentally, I think my mother's judgment was right on okay. that particular occasion. There you go, you're on the record. I mean, when you think of what has ultimately happened to communism, it was obviously that it should be exposed to sunlight. Sunlight yes. is always valuable. Mm. What was Menzies' greatest failure? I suppose he's very difficult when you look back on a career that has been so successful as his greatest failure. I mean, I'm often asked what my greatest failure was as Prime Minister, and I invariably say, allowing the Pakistani army to talk me into bowling in Kashmir. <laughs> uh, I, I think that was a terrible mistake. Now, I'm quite sure, I, mean, I think probably he was in error in the way he handled that referendum, but he wasn't wrong in assessing the fundamental menace of communism, even in Australia at the time. And one of the interesting things of recent years is that Books have come out and there's been more reflective analysis of security agencies of both Britain and America at that time, which has really demonstrated that the Petrov defection was very important. Mm. I've just finished reading a book on, it's called Five Eyes, which is about the security arrangements between America, Britain, Australia, New Zealand and Canada. And, and it dwells quite extensively on that period. And there's no doubt that Petrov was able to alert because of his defection the West and to Australia and America and Britain to the activities of Soviet spies. So he wasn't wrong about that. Look, it's easy to... Menzies, for example, held views on arbitration that I certainly didn't hold and no member of my government would have held 
But then it was a different period. Yes. But I, I mean, he was wrong. Was it a mistake? No. But did he have a different view? Of course he did. He had a different view on industry protection. Mm. It was an era of industry protection. One of the very interesting features of that period of time was that there was almost a bipartisan consensus on controlled exchange rates, government ownership of commercial assets, and a belief that that would all continue. So I acknowledge, of course, he did make mistakes, but the fundamentals, strong national security, booming economy, a more tolerant society, a commitment to education, they're all real pluses. It was, of course, his successor, Harold Holt, who finally demolished the White Australia policy. On his successors, he retired of his own choosing in January 1966 and then was followed by a series of successors until the Gough Whitlam's government was elected Mm. in 1972. So... Was it his shadow that troubled the Liberal Party leaders after that? Was that an issue? I mean, obviously, Harold Holt met his own unfortunate demise through no fault of his own, but Menzies' influence was enormous, clearly, on the party. Was that tricky thing? No, I don't think so. I I think that has been overemphasised. It was inevitable that once he retired that the world was going to be very different. And Harold Holt... um, took advantage of that. He used it to his benefit and the country's benefit. He emphasised the importance of our links to Asia in a more personal sense than Menzies had, although policy-wise, as I said earlier, the links with Japan had been well and truly established during the Menzies period, and that was a very significant opening. I think it was inevitable we were going to see a big change, and the events of those years between really the end of 67, so 68 through to 72, were, I think, less influenced by the shadow of Menzies than many people imagine. I remember the mood in the party after Menzies. I'd go to meetings and people say, oh, you know, it's not the same. But after a relatively short period of time, people got used to the fact that he was no longer there. But he had been there for such a long period of time. He'd founded the party. He'd come back from the, not only the political dead to form the Liberal Party and to get back into office, but he'd also come back from the close political death in 1961. Oh, that's right. He went very close, and but he came back from that. And he did have an enormous influence, but he wasn't the only person who shaped the attitude of the Liberal Party on economic and other issues. So if you put it to me in the boat, was it because Menzies so dominated the scene that he crowded out people of ability? No, I don't think so. I think there were plenty of people of ability. Some chose to leave politics. Others, well, Barwick went, became Chief Justice of the High Court. Who knows if he had remained in politics, would he have been a rival to Gorton if he'd been around when Harold Holt drowned? There were Ructions between the country party and the Liberal Party over the level of the exchange rate. Would they have been there if Menzies had been Prime Minister still? But then nobody lasts forever. He was 71. And in that era, that was an amazing age. Well, it was a very to... long period yeah, of time. Yeah. And, and he was the oldest person to hold the office of Prime Minister. You were treasurer in the Fraser government. Fraser, yeah. And this was a time when you had the wets and the dries, Mm. particularly on economic policy. I mean, Menzies and that era would definitely be considered more of a wet in terms of economic policy than economic conservative sort of Milton Mm. Friedman, Mm. Margaret Thatcher-esque policies that were to come. Was his name ever invoked in those debates ever or was... Occasionally. I think it's fair to say, Georgina, that the... Wet dry divide really emerged after we went into opposition. Most of the people in the Fraser cabinet, and I had great admiration for them, they were more of the interventionist school. Yeah. Because it had appeared to work. I mean, if something works, you don't change it. You know, the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. People believed that the economic policies of that Menzies period were the right ones because they worked. When the McMahon government was defeated in 1972, unemployment in Australia was less than 2%. Amazing, yeah. It's just amazing. And 
Okay, we were arguing about percentiles. The famous speech that Gough Whitlam delivered at Blacktown in Sydney to launch his 1972 campaign, he unveiled all these new bodies he was going to create and all these things he was going to do. And he said, you may well ask, how is it going to be paid for? He said, men and women of Australia, it will be paid for out of the huge and automatic increase in tax revenues from a growing economy. Mm. In other words, the assumption was that the good, the good times, times keep would, rolling. Were, were, <laughs> would keep rolling. And yeah. now, and that was wrong, but it was not a completely wild assumption at the time if you were of that disposition, if you believed that everything could be fixed by the government, which, of course, most Liberals didn't then and don't now. But the world was about to change. You had the quadrupling of world oil prices, the movement off the fixed exchange rate system established at Bretton Woods after World War II. So. But it was just an indication of how committed people were. But it was when some of the continuing good times were challenged in the 70s that that's when you started to see the emergence of a different debate and of course it did mimic the period when Margaret Thatcher although she was later on it wasn't at the end of the 70s and Reagan and there was a movement all around the world of questioning the Keynesian assumption about the government constantly intervening to regulate the economy. I wanted to finish our discussion today, Mr Howard, by asking you about your thoughts on Jim Chalmers, the current federal Mm. treasurer's Mm. thoughts on the market and the economy and how it should function. He wrote a piece earlier this month where he wants to introduce this idea of values-based capitalism. Now, a cursory reading of that starts to remind me of the arguments of Ben Chifley in the 40s that it's the government that knows best in terms of managing markets and that markets should be created by the government and government intervention into markets will socialise and civilise these. Do you think we are going back to those days of a Chifley-esque Labor Party policy when it comes to economic? And how does that present a challenge to Australia, but also well, to, the, uh, to Menzies Liberals? The first yeah. thing that came to my mind when I read about the Treasurer's thought piece was Kevin Rudd. He mm. did the same thing over a Christmas break and one could well ask what happened to him. But I am really sceptical. Now, worse than sceptical, I'm downright suspicious when I hear a Labor Party leader, and he is, he's treasurer in the Labor government, talking about making capitalism better. Mm. No government can make capitalism better except by maintaining the minimum level of interference with the ordinary operation of market forces consistent with competitive market and fair play according to the values and principles of our society. But this notion that governments can intervene to the benefit of all of us, I have far more faith in the capacity of Australian entrepreneurs and their advisors and their workforces to create a vigorous market than I do the attitudes of somebody who's probably never run or been involved in the running of a business. I think one of the terrible problems we face in Australian politics at the moment is that we have fewer people going into politics who've done anything other than work in politics. Mm. All of the time they've been drawing a salary. We shouldn't have parliament full of lawyers. We shouldn't have a parliament full of farmers. We shouldn't have a parliament full of of businessmen and women. But we should have a parliament that's got a reasonable number of people who know how the market works. And it's only when you get a parliament increasingly populated by people who've done nothing other than work in politics that you get people like Jim Chalmers thinking that the government knows better than the businessman and the businesswoman how to run a market and how to operate in a market. That really worries me a great deal. It is is just so redolent of somebody who doesn't understand how a market... I mean, a market is created when you have the interaction of competitive forces, of buyers and sellers... Now, sure, you've got to have some rules of the road. You have to have some laws against undue concentration of power 
and abuse of power, but the idea that a government, particularly a government made up of people who are predominantly the product of the trade union movement and the political class, who don't really know anything about how markets operate. Name five people in the current government whose principal working experience has been private enterprise. You'll be hard put. On that note, thank you very much for your time. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.